holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captain of a scientific technological elite. We signed a climate convention on the importance of economic instruments and free markets were included in this mammoth uh, Agenda 21 document and the Rio Declaration. Now, let me be clear on one fundamental point. Uh, the United States fully intends to be the world's preeminent leader in protecting the global environment. Coming up, Technocracy News. This is Patrick Wood for Technocracy News and Trends. Today is April 1st, 2019. First story we'll start out with today is good news and a tip of the hat to Utah. The headline reads, HB 57, Utah now requires a search warrant to access electronic data. Utah now has the strongest protection of your private data of any state in the nation. That includes cell phone contents. The story starts out, uh, Governor Gary Herbert signed off on HB 57 on Wednesday, that's last Wednesday, designating Utah as the state with the strongest data privacy laws in the country when it comes to law enforcement accessing electronic information. House Bill 57 modified provisions about privacy of electronic information and data for Utahns Representative Craig Hall pitched the bill in order to require police to get search warrants before accessing Utah's electronic information, which up to this point has not been a necessity. Traditionally, we have pretty good protection with case law and statutes that protect our physical stuff if law enforcement wants to search any of our belongings, such as homes, cars, hard drives, Hall explained, if law enforcement wants to search any of those things, they have to get a warrant first. Well, again, hats off to Utah for seeing the light on this and blocking police from illegal search and seizure of your information, especially when it comes to your cell phone, and requiring them to get a search warrant first. This should be a no-brainer, but it wasn't. And some states right now require you to hand over your phone if you're stopped at a traffic stop, for instance. If the officer says, I'd like to see your phone, and you give it to him, they're allowed to download every shred of information off your smartphone. This is uh, obviously not a good thing, but uh, note that police organizations fought Utah on this bill. They were uh, against it, of course, because they say that it uh, denies them of a critical crime-stopping or crime-preventing technique. Too bad. Uh, Utah has spoken, the legislators have spoken, and it's a great thing that I believe that they've done. Other states should follow suit. The next two stories concern artificial intelligence, and in particular, the emotional state of artificial intelligence. Story number one is headline, AI can hate you with no human input. And several recent studies have shown, actually, that deep learning AI can develop biases just like humans do. The problem is that AI is completely void of human emotion, modeling a schizoid personality disorder. The story starts out, what if a robot decides it hates you? This might seem like a silly question, but according to research, Developing prejudice towards others does not require a high level of cognitive ability. It could easily be exhibited by robots and other artificially intelligent machines. So if robots decide that they do not like you individually or mankind in general, this could be a very serious development because they might well find no use for us and decide just to uh, resist us and remove us from the scene, from the equation. Well, this is a far-fetched possibility for sure because robots are not that powerful today. 
But this is not a good trend. The biases of humans are finding their way into artificial intelligence algorithms. The second story is titled, AI Can't Understand or Duplicate Humor. This is another human subtlety that isn't discussed very much, I suppose, but we must remember that AI is a machine algorithm and not a human mind. Humor is a very delicate quality of humans. Some people have a great sense of humor. Others don't have such a great sense of humor. But humor is something that's peculiar to humans and humanity. But AI does not share any semblance of human emotion, of course, including humor. And every rendering of judgment will be made on a sterile machine logic Should AI be left making decisions for humans? I don't think so. So when humans make funny or humans make jokes, AI is not going to be able to understand the subtleties of the humor and very possibly will simply take our statements or our actions literally and make decisions accordingly, not understanding that humor was involved. The next story is somewhat disturbing because China-style total surveillance technology is coming to America in increasing influence. In this case, it's Detroit. Now, Technocracy News has repeatedly warned that the China model of technocracy and scientific dictatorship was coming to America. Well, it has in Detroit. Also, though, New Orleans and San Diego, they're all bent on total surveillance of their citizens. The article starts out, the push to turn America's cities into Chinese-style surveillance networks has found a new partner in Detroit, Michigan. Now, that's what the author wrote. It's not what I wrote. The only difference, he continues, between what is happening in San Diego and what is happening in Detroit is they are not using the same smart street lights to spy on everyone. Detroit uses IntelliStreets, a company known to have strong ties to Homeland Security. So Detroit now is putting in surveillance cameras in every conceivable location and monitoring them with artificial intelligence and also humans as they have big screens with multiple uh, little video windows in them to be able to watch um, different areas of the city. And they're tying into all types of video cameras that are installed either by businesses, by residents, and by the city itself. So Detroit, which is not the bastion of economic freedom in the first place, is now subjecting its citizens essentially to scientific dictatorship. Well, I guess that's one way to control them. It's not the American way, but they're doing it anyway. If you've ever wondered why the global Internet of Things market is racing forward without public support, it's for this reason. The market is expected to reach $330 billion by 2025. This is huge. The Internet of Things market has been growing at a rate of 23% per year for several years now. This is causing a feeding frenzy, you might imagine, of big tech firms. There's no place in the world, no industry in the world, that you can get this kind of growth, considering most everything else is stagnant these days, including real estate. But big tech firms are clamoring for their share of the money. I'd point out, though, this is largely an artificial market created by big tech firms themselves, none of whom qualify as legitimate urban planners. The study reports the worldwide development of smart cities is trending majorly. Smart cities are formed by the integration of advanced technologies such as geospatial technology, the blockchain, Internet of Things, and artificial intelligence, among others. Internet of Things holds prime importance as compared to other IT technologies. In smart cities, IoT provides the perfect platform for uninterrupted communication of data that is generated from smart electronic devices. This pretty much sums it up. Smart city design is designed by big tech firms, not by urban planners. There is no public demand for this, In fact, by and large, the public resists electronic dictatorship. But considering the vast amounts of money floating around, it's no wonder that they've created for themselves the perfect storm. They're taking every advantage of it that they can. The last story needs a little extra 
explanation. AT&T taps Argonne National Labs for Climate Change Resiliency Project. My only comment on this is that technocrats of a feather flock together. The National Lab System, which sits underneath the Department of Energy, including Argonne, has been densely populated with technocrats for decades. Together with AT&T now, Argonne will spend millions on mitigating climate change using sophisticated computer modeling that has been developed, of course, at Argonne. So the story starts out, AT&T has engaged the U.S. Department of Energy's Argonne National Laboratory for help on a climate change resiliency project to better anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to the impacts of climate change. This is the first such project publicly announced in the telecommunications industry. It has brought together insights from Argonne National Lab's leading climate environmental science with AT&T data scientists. This has led to AT&T developing a climate change analysis tool that will help anticipate potential impacts of climate change on our network infrastructure and business operations 30 years into the future. Well, AT&T has drunk the Kool-Aid, so to speak, and they're spending millions on this project using Argonne National Labs as a sounding board and as an input to create a program for themselves to stay out of the way of climate change. Well, they won't have too much trouble staying out of its way if it doesn't exist in the first place. It's worth pointing out from my first book on technocracy, which was Technocracy Rising, the Trojan Horse of Global Transformation, the cozy relationship between the Department of Energy and technocracy. There's a short passage in Technocracy Rising I'd like to read for you to explain this interesting relationship. This is a direct quote. On October 27, 2009, the Obama administration unveiled its smart grid plan by awarding $3.4 billion to 100 smart grid projects. According to the Department of Energy's first press release, these awards were to result in the installation of more than 850 sensors called phaser measurement units to monitor the overall power grid nationwide, 200,000 smart transformers, 700 automated substations, about 5% of the nation's total, 1 million in-home displays, 345,000 load control devices in homes. This was the kickstart of smart grid in the U.S. on January 8, 2010. President Obama unveiled an additional $2.3 billion in federal funding program for the energy manufacturing sector as part of the $787 billion American Reinvestment and Recovery Act. Funding had already been awarded in advance to projects in 43 states pending Obama's announcement. One such project in the Northwest was headed by Battelle Memorial Institute, remember that name, covering five states and targeting 60,000 customers. The project was actually developed by the Bonneville Power Administration, BPA, a federal agency under the Department of Energy. Since it is pointedly illegal for a federal agency to apply for federal funds, BPA passed the project off to Battelle, a nonprofit, non-governmental organization, which was promptly awarded $178 million. It is important to note that BPA takes credit for originating the smart grid concept in the early 1990s, which it termed Energy Web. And rewind that just for a second here. It's important to note that BPA takes credit for originating the smart grid concept in the early 1990s. They called it the Energy Web. This alone is evidence that the wheels of technocracy were turning years before the turn of the century. It is also interesting to note that Washington State was a hotbed of technocracy membership and supporters in the 1930s and is currently home to the headquarters of Technocracy Incorporated. According to Patel's August 27, 2009 press release, the project will involve more than 60,000 metered customers in Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, and Wyoming. Using smart grid technologies, the project will engage system assets exceeding 112 megawatts, the equivalent of power to serve 86,000 households. 
The proposed demonstration will study smart grid benefits at an unprecedented geographic breadth across five states, spanning the electrical system from generation to end use, and containing many key functions of the future smart grid, said Mike Davis, a Battelle vice president. The intended impact of this project will span well beyond traditional utility service boundaries, helping to enable a future grid that meets local, regional, and national needs. Battelle and BPA work closely together, and there was an obvious blurring as to who was really in control of the project's management during the test period. In a for internal use only document written in August 2009, BPA offered talking points to its partners. Smart grid technology includes everything from interactive appliances in homes to smart meters, substation, automation, and sensors on transmission lines. The cozy relationship that exists between private industry or private NGO and the Department of Energy is full of conflicts of interest. In this case, AT&T is commingling public funds to achieve an outcome that's going to specifically benefit AT&T. I'm Patrick Wood for Technocracy News and Trends. Mm-hmm.